We drink three billion cups of tea a day. There are 1,500 varieties. But not all tea is created equal. The finest orange pico tea from India is some of the most expensive in the world, costing up to $600 a kilo. This is tea making as an art form. How do they do it? Two thousand meters above sea level, in the lush hills of Tamil Nadu, you'll find the Chamraj Tea Estate. There are so many different kinds of tea. Black tea, white tea, green tea, Lapsang, Sushan, Earl Grey, Darjeeling. You would think that they all come from different plants, but they don't. They're actually all leaves from the same plant, Camellia sinensis. The only difference is where the plant is grown and how long the leaves are allowed to ferment. Green tea is fermented for the least amount of time and black tea the longest. These fertile hills are the perfect breeding ground for tea plants. But the sun that gives them life can also bake them to destruction. So the farmers take cuttings from the best adult plants and nurture them in a tea nursery. Tea takes time. After 18 months in the nursery, the plants are ready to go back outside, sheltered from direct sunlight by the shade of silver oak trees. With tea leaves, size matters. But it's not the bigger, older leaves that are most prized. It's the smaller, younger leaves that hold the most flavour and make the grade of orange pico. Orange pico is a strange name for tea. Pico comes from the Chinese for white tips, which refers to the young leaves that are used to make the tea. And the word orange was added by Dutch tea merchants. They named it after the Royal House of Orange to give the tea some kind of royal seal of approval. Tools could bruise the precious plants. So each worker carefully uses their fingers to prevent damaging the leaves and ensure the plant's health for the next harvest. Loading up baskets that are roped around their foreheads each worker hand picks more than half their body weight in tea every day, up to 30 kilos a shift, which is bagged up and taken to the nearby factory. Here, they process up to 40 tons of tea a day. Their first problem is the leaves contain too much moisture, so they're spread on something called a withering trough. This blows hot air across the leaves to partially dry them out. As leaves wither, microorganisms break down their chemical structure, kicking off a process called oxidation, which darkens the tea's colour and gives it its taste. If the leaves dry out completely, oxidation would stop before they developed any flavour. So just like any good cuppa, timing is everything. The next challenge is to purge the partially dried tea of stones and dirt from the fields. A vibrating table levels the leaves before a giant sieve removes any unwanted particles. To mature the deep, rich notes of orange pico, the leaves get a battering by this machine. Three crankshafts rotate the table, bruising the tea and causing it to blacken. This breaks down its cellular structure and speeds up oxidation, helping to develop the tea's aroma and mellow its taste, reducing bitterness. A humidifier sprays a fine mist of water to keep the leaves moist and prolong oxidation. But the timing has to be perfect. If it over-oxidizes, the whole batch will be ruined. To prevent that, they now need to dry the leaves, and fast. So the tea passes into an oven heated to 100 degrees Celsius. 
As the moisture evaporates over 40 minutes, the oxidation process stops with the flavor just right. Have you ever wondered why Americans prefer coffee? It all comes down to the Boston Tea Party. In the 18th century, the Americans rebelled against their British rulers by dumping vast quantities of tea into the Chesapeake Bay. From that point on, US patriots tried to wean themselves off of tea in an act of defiance. The tea may be drinkable, but it's still full of stalks that you wouldn't want in your mug. So it's over to a beady-eyed computer. Stalks are lighter in color than the blackened leaves, and the machine uses infrared to spot the difference. Anything that's the wrong shade is blasted away by compressed air. While the unadulterated leaves are ready for the tea guru. Very fruity flavor. Hector is a planter with over 40 years experience. He's a director of the estate and a master tea taster. It is more similar to the wine tasting. So you have to really take the tea to your back of your tongue and keep it for one or two seconds. Good tea taste. To keep his palate in tip-top tea tasting condition, Hector is teetotal. Abstaining from alcohol keeps his taste buds fine-tuned. On average, he tastes around 350 cups of tea a day. And he wouldn't change jobs for all the tea in China. If you said you wouldn't do something for all the tea in China, do you know how much tea you're talking about? China still produces more tea than any other country. It's like $5 billion worth. What wouldn't you do for $5 billion? This tea gets the master's seal of approval, and it's ready to ship around the world. As for Hector, he's earned a tea break. Warsaw, Poland. In winter, temperatures here plummet to minus five degrees Celsius. But Warsaw has a novel way of keeping its residents warm. And it's buried deep underground. How do they do it? During the Second World War, Warsaw was virtually razed to the ground. As they rebuilt the city, Poland's post-war communist regime installed the ultimate underfloor heating. Hidden beneath Warsaw streets are 1,700 kilometers of giant heating pipes, the largest centralized heating system in Europe, serving over a million people. Socialist central heating. Warming thousands of homes requires a bit more than a combi boiler. It takes the Sikirki combined heat and power plant. Eight kilometers from the city center, they burn one and a half million tons of coal a year to generate electricity for over half a million homes. They also provide heat for more than half the buildings in Warsaw. Power stations work by burning fuel to boil water, turning it into steam. The steam creates high pressure that drives a turbine and generates electricity. You know those tall towers that you see at old power stations with stuff coming out the top? They're cooling towers. They're actually full of steam, but only a small amount of it escapes from the top. Most of the steam condenses into water and is pumped back for reuse. The sole purpose of those towers is to remove heat. But with this power plant, instead of wasting the heat, they put it to use. The hot steam is sent to this massive container called a heat exchanger. Inside, pipes circulate the steam through the water for the heating system, which emerges at 95 degrees Celsius. All this hot water needs to be stored somewhere. Somewhere big. This skyscraping hot water tank is 45 meters high and holds more than 30 million liters, enough water to run 375,000 hot baths. The challenge is getting it to over a million people. The answer is 1,700 kilometers of insulated underground pipes. That's enough to stretch from Warsaw to London and the network is still growing. 
in most cities, new homes need new boilers. Here, they have to rip up the whole road. Pavel Zurowski oversees the latest network extension. There is a lot of pressure because we are doing that in whole, whole winter, so in the very tough uh, conditions. Just like your home central heating, Warsaw's subterranean pipes are constantly full of water, which is heated and recirculated from the plant. But it's an old system and an endless battle to keep things flowing smoothly. So they employ a 700-strong army of heating engineers. Today, Christoph Strezajek is on the lookout for leaks. Sprawdzamy, w jakiej kondycji jest są kanały ciepłownicze i i rurociągi, ze względu na to, żeby prze uprzedzić awarię. Najstarsze odcinki sieci ciepłowniczej w Warszawie mogą mieć 50 lat. District heating isn't a new thing. In the 14th century, a small village in France used hot water from a geothermal spring and a series of wooden pipes to heat their homes. Christoph's biggest problem is that many of the underground tunnels are too small and dangerous to access. So this historic city has a high-tech solution. Robots to the rescue. 15 years ago, the system was losing 34,000 cubic meters of water a day. Thanks to the likes of Christoph and his remote-controlled friends, that's dropped by 80%. Three pumping stations like this one push out hot water to heat 80% of the buildings in Warsaw. That includes the National Football Stadium, the Chancellery of the Prime Minister, and 19,000 other buildings. Once they've pumped hot water to a building, the next problem is distributing it to all the flats inside. Again, the answer is buried underground, this time in the basement. A mini heat exchanger provides hot water for local residents. Once the water in the heat exchanger reaches 73 degrees, it's channeled through super-insulated pipes to radiators inside each flat. No one flat needs its own boiler, and heating costs are reduced by half. So whatever the weather outside, Inside, Warsaw's residents are kept warm by an engineering marvel. The ultimate in centralised heating.